I'd like to welcome everybody and, and thank you for uh, attending this session. Uh, my name is Bruce Schlein. I'm from Citibank. And uh, in this setting, um, I have to place emphasis on bank so as not to be confused with other cities. Uh, <clears throat> so why, why are we talking about this topic? Why is it important? Um, there are uh, a number of trends, climate change, urbanization, and several others that are driving changes in the approach and type to infrastructure in cities. And that approach and those types have a direct bearing on the finance. And that is presenting some challenges, but also opportunities to innovate. And those opportunities are being presented to, to cities and also to the financial institutions that, that they work with. These approaches are systematic, and finance is just one piece of the equation. And finance is informed by those systematic changes, but also informs them. So we're going to hear from a number of, uh, of representatives from C40 cities today that are going to share with us uh, examples that illustrate some of these new approaches and types. I also want to point out that the recent report from C40 and some of their findings supports uh, what we're going to talk about today. The fact that a number of cities have funds in place, others that have banks in place, I think those trends um, represent interesting signals for the market and to financial institutions to think about what potential gaps need to be filled or how we might complement those types of efforts. I think the other thing that's really important and interesting from the report is the fact that a lot of these initiatives are now moving from pilot to scale. And that is a really important phenomena for finance because scale can help facilitate um, new financial solutions. I'd also just like to mention that, um, that City and C40 have entered into a, a partnership. Um, that partnership is based on a number of years of us working together uh, initially with the Clinton Climate Initiative, which is now merged with the C40, uh, working together on energy efficiency solutions for our own buildings and then solutions for, for clients. And we really think that our capabilities and geographic footprint and C40's um, capabilities and relationships are quite complementary. And we think uh, they're also quite complementary with um, the other financial institution that C40 has entered into a partnership with, that's the World Bank. And uh, we really look forward to working together uh, with, with uh, both groups to seeing how we might support cities as they, as they innovate and seek to uh, find new finance solutions in this space. And I look forward to working with my colleague James Alexander, who's here and the second row from C40. I don't know if Steve Hammer is here from the World Bank, but he's uh, 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 the other colleague that, uh, that we'll be working with. Um, on your chairs, there's a, uh, a brief primer that, uh, that James and I put together that uh, is meant to serve as a, a, uh, a framework and a discussion piece to begin to think about how we approach this issue together. So we welcome you to, to take a look at that. And lastly, uh, before we move on to our speakers, I'm going to ask all of them to forgive me in advance for keeping them to their 10 minute allotments. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have questions and, and ideas of your own that you want to contribute to this discussion and we want to make sure that we keep time for that. So I'm, I'm um, uh, again, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm going to be uh, tough on the timekeeping so that we have lots of time for, uh, for good dialogue. Uh, with that, let me um, introduce our, our first speaker. He's the, uh, the mayor of Basel, uh, uh, Mayor Guy, uh, Guy Morin. Thank you.
Yes, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate being here as co-chair of the Sustainable Infrastructure Finance Network. As we all know, the C40 Sustainable Infrastructure Finance Network works to develop and disseminate financing solutions for sustainable urban infrastructure and provide opportunities for C40 cities to share project development tools and expertise. We were asked to focus on the financing mechanism cities are using to deliver their, the infrastructure needed to achieve their carbon emissions reduction and climate adaptation targets. First, why are we talking about sustainable inf infrastructure? Why is it so important and crucial for cities to be sustainable and to operate sustainable infrastructures? Sustainable infrastructure allows households to opt for sustainable lifestyles, offers sustainability choices to management and business development, and creates new sustainable jobs and economic growth. Innovative financing mechanisms and policies make the co-benefits and opportunities of sustainability accessible to investors. It helps the investor to lower political, resource and credit default risk, to lower transaction and running costs, to allow for lower borrowing rates, to provide outstanding residual value, and to lower liquidity risk by smoothing cash flows. So far, the general introduction into the issue. But how is the city of Basel going to manage its infrastructure? In addition to common investments, which we generate from common taxes, the infrastructure finance policy of Basel follows the cost by cause principle. That means that the cause of pollution, of an emission, or simply of an unsustainable situation pays for the damage or the situation he causes. This is also called the polluter liability. This principle leads to self-regulation effects. Because our system is built in a way that the more the causer causes, the more he has to pay for it. In the end, this system leads to economical, social and environmental sustainability. And of course, this kind of system has to lead inherently to environmental sustainability because pricing the utilization of something leads to a controlled utilization and the end to less utilization and finally to less pollution and less emission. I want to demonstrate with this on the basis of, few, of a few examples from my hometown. First example, the city of Basel demands a fee of 50% for the added value of real estate caused by special planning measures of the city as changing zoning plans working out land development or master plans. That means each time planning measures are taken by the city, which have a positive impact on the value of the property of an owner of a real estate, the owner has to deliver 50% of this added value. It is a win-win situation because the owner still has an added value. And please consider that he has contributed truly nothing to it. The fee feeds a fund, and this fund is used for creating new or evaluating existing green spaces as parks, alleys, urban woods, and so on. This fund is strictly linked to this kind of use by law. Second example, the city of Basel charges the disposal of waste since 1993. Garbage can only be disposed in an official garbage bag or container, which will be collected by the public waste disposal system. It is priced by its capacity. That means the more waste you dispose, the more you are charged. This system leads to less waste on the whole. 
And it's truly remarkable that in the meantime, it leads to higher recycling rates and recycle materials. So this is a triple sustainable system again. The costs of the infrastructure are covered, the amount of waste is reduced, and the people's awareness of disposal subjects and recycling possibility is raised. Third example, the city of Basel knows a steering tax on electricity consumption since 1998. Each consumer of electricity pays a few cents per kilowatt hour. This money runs into a fund. By the end of the year, each electricity consumer gets the equal amount out from the fund transferred on his bank account. That means again that the consumer using more electricity pays more than a saving consumer. If you used almost no electricity, you would make even a profit. And again, people's awareness concerning electric power consumption is sharpened. Fourth example, the city of Basel collects a royalty on electricity since 1985. 9% of the network fees run into a fund. This fund has about 10 million Swiss francs available every year. The city of Basel uses the fund to support private investments in renewable infrastructure, energy efficiency, energy awareness, and future technologies. And the last example, the city of Basel is about to establish a bi-level parking card system for public parking space. This system should privilege residents, their visitors, commuters, and the commerce. The fees we collect are used for park and ride or similar project outside the city. This system will lead to an optional utilization of public parking lots, the reduction of parking traffic around the parking lots and simultaneously in the quarters the reduction of demand for public space for parking and the reduction of traffic on the whole. I hope I could give you a close insight on how Basel is trying to manage its infrastructure and what kind of models can be used to participate to residents as consumers and polluters. At the end of my presentation, I want to speak about our cooperation within C40. For the moment, it is concentrated in co-chairing the Sustainable Infrastructure Finance Network with Chicago and by hosting the Global Infrastructure Basel Summit. In this framework, the City of Basel supports C40 cities with a dedicated program at the Global Infrastructure Basel Summit 2014. We are looking forward to a fruitful cooperation and I thank you for your attention. I'm on the time. <laughs> One minute left. Okay, thank you very much. So our next speaker, uh, Deputy Mayor of Warsaw, Michal Oshevsky. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michal Oshevsky. I'm Deputy Mayor of Warsaw. Uh, capital city of Poland, um, in my uh, scope of duties, uh, uh, financing of the project is one of the most important. Uh, I'm also responsible for the strategy of the development, economic development issues, social housing, uh, flooding, and some other issues. All of them uh, sometimes is uh, uh, matching the problem of climate change. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce the city, because uh, the scale of the city also uh, uh, allow you to understand the problem that we are overcoming now. Uh, the city is uh, 500 uh, uh, square kilometers uh, large, and uh, we have 1.7 million inhabitants uh, within the limits, officially. And officially, we, we count that it's uh, something about 2 million. 3.3 uh, million in, in, in the total agglomeration. Um, the, one of the important things about the city that you have to know, it's the lower unemployment rates and very high uh, rates of uh, uh, green areas in the city. Uh, we have 23% of the city uh, covered by the green area, uh, um, counting uh, uh, also 
uh, among the, this area, we also have natural park uh, within city limits. I know the, the, the same situation has only Moscow in, the, in Europe uh, uh, with the forestation of the, of the city. Uh, about financing, um, of course, there is a lot of data, data on, the, on the slides. Sorry for uh, uh, maybe confusing uh, situation for you, but I'm going to uh, um, uh, point out the, the most important thing from the slide. Uh, we started our large program of the infrastructure for the sustainable development in 2007. Uh, mainly, this program was based on our own budget. Uh, as you saw on the, on the previous slide, we have 3.3 uh, uh, billion of euro uh, yearly as a budget. 80% is the operational cost of the city, 20% we, we spend for investments. Uh, some investments are, uh, are possible uh, uh, because of uh, municipal bonds, which we issue on the, on the market. 20% uh, is uh, on European market uh, bonds issued, 80% uh, is uh, coming on the, from, the, from the internal market. Uh, also thanks to the Citibank, because uh, Citibank is in also uh, uh, operating uh, our accounts and the, the, the whole financial system also helping us uh, uh, with some uh, 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 operation of, on bonds. Uh, we have our own infrastructure companies, uh, and that's why some of investments are, uh, are so some project financing is uh, is shaped uh, already on the on the on the municipal companies, not on the city. So and, and this way, we we try to uh, um, find the, uh, the route how to uh, uh, allow um, uh, finance the projects, which are mainly uh, um, let's say financed by the from the clients especially in the water and wastewater uh, treatment. Uh, at, at the same time, that they don't, uh, um, uh, they don't uh, uh, go to the hour uh, limit of the, of the debt that we have, uh, basing on the Polish uh, law, it's the European standard, uh, we, can have, uh, we can have more than 60% of, uh, of debt uh, yearly uh, in the relation to our incomes. And uh, this, uh, uh, actually we have now uh, 46 uh, of this limit, so still we have a reserve to, to invest. Uh, nationally, we have uh, a system of fin financing uh, uh, which uh, allow us to get the money for uh, uh, environmental infrastructure. Uh, this money is collected by the state, by the region and by the uh, city. Uh, the money comes from uh, penalties uh, for using environment. Uh, it, we call it uh, funds for environment. Uh, we have national funds, which, uh, which mainly uh, uh, finance the, the, the big projects. Uh, then we have regional uh, uh, fund, which mainly is uh, uh, now concentrating focus uh, on, uh, on project of, uh, for housing. And then we have our own uh, funds. Uh, it's yearly 10 million of euro, which we spend only for environmental issues. Uh, because of the uh, problems that we have with flooding, uh, mainly 80% of this fund is going now for the flooding infrastructure. Uh, but also we, uh, we, we, uh, we subsidize uh, private uh, uh, households uh, to uh, get, for example, uh, access to the wastewater uh, pipelines. So that's the, one of the models of the financing which comes from the penalties. For example, if you cut a tree in the city, you have to pay the penalty for the city and the, the money from the cutting the trees is going for the, for the funds. If the tree is uh, very precious for the city, the, uh, the scale of the, of the penalty is really very high. Uh, of course, we're using commercial credits, but uh, uh, actually it's l l lower than 1% uh, uh, so, so of, the, of the money that, we com that comes from the commercial credits uh, for the, our infrastructure. Uh, the very important uh, uh, financing instruments which we use, it's uh, European Investment Bank and European uh, Bank for, uh, for Reconstruction and Development, uh, which are European uh, uh, facilities for, uh, uh, for money. But the most important, and it's going to be commercial for European Union, is the European Union money, which we use from Cohesion Fund to, uh, to construct uh, uh, our project. We are a member of Con Convenant of Mayors, and uh, we also adopted our sustainable uh, uh, action plan. Now, as you can see from the slide, maybe if you, uh, if you, if you find the, the proper information, uh, the last point is the, the, that was this, this our uh, priority action now. So is the uh, improvement of the public transport. Uh, uh, we spent already uh, 2 billion of euro for uh, improving uh, uh, public transportation in the city. Uh, half of this money coming from European Union, a half is coming from the credits from the EIB and EB EBRD. Uh, we uh, have the most important project in the city now uh, already completed. 
And it's, this project shows uh, how important infrastructure, how important is the infrastructure for the city. Uh, the city from the east, central eastern Europe have the same situation. We have a, a huge gap in the infrastructure, especially uh, in the water treatment and wastewater treatment plants. And uh, that's why the, the, the most important goal in the uh, last few years was to complete uh, the infrastructure. This uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, uh, already cover or, or uh, treat the wastewater from the 60% uh, of the city. Uh, we have another one which, which cover the rest of the city. But the most important uh, effect that which, which we get last year is uh, that we uh, don't uh, jet any, any wastewater to, to the river uh, without treatment. Uh, now the, the water that comes out from the wastewater treatment plant is cleaner than the water that is in Vistula River. So that shows uh, that we are, we are cleaning now the, the river uh, and not, uh, not polluting. Uh, this project was uh, financed uh, by 25% uh, from uh, Cohesion Fund. The rest is financed from uh, uh, European in Investment Bank. Uh, the company, it's, it's the typical pro um, uh, project financing. It is uh, operating on, uh, on our, uh, our company, uh, which collect the uh, which service for, for the people and collect the money for, for the services. Um, it's the one question, what could be if we not, don't, don't get the, the money from the European Union? Uh, it's the very obvious uh, answer. The money that uh, the, the client's going to pay is going to be higher, uh, or going to be ra raised, uh, raised up. Uh, we have uh, uh, a very clean rule in the European Union. Uh, we, we cannot subsidize any environmental infrastructure because of the uh, polluters pay principle. And that's why um, uh, uh, just to uh, keep the prices of the uh, wastewater and water uh, at the, let's say, um, good level, uh, affordable, uh, we, uh, we finance it uh, from the public finances uh, as well here in, from the European Union. But the share is 25% because of the financial gap, which, uh, which is, the rest is covered by the incomes and the credits. Uh, the, uh, the, next, uh, the next thing, uh, it's, uh, it's the uh, financing of the infrastructure. Uh, as I told you, uh, uh, it's the biggest, uh, um, let's say, an investment of the city now is in the public transportation. We already spent two billion of euro for improving the public transportation, mainly for reconstructing underground and exchanging rolling stock uh, uh, of the uh, trams. Uh, uh, actually, as a city, we have four companies uh, which operating for for the city. The one solution which we use, which is very good uh, uh, to show uh, internationally, is that we are signing uh, multi-annual uh, 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 contracts with our companies, and basing on these contracts. The companies can take money from, uh, from the market uh, just to renew uh, rolling stock, and they paid off uh, the, 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 uh, the credits from our, our contracts. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, some pilot projects, especially on smart metering. Uh, uh, this project is, uh, is mainly based on international cooperation. Uh, uh, usually we, uh, we, we get or we enter into the consortium and we, uh, within this consortium we, uh, we try to look uh, for the solutions which we can use for, for normal households in the city. And by using um, smart measuring as a pilot project, we uh, foster the people to, uh, to uh, enter to these innovative uh, instruments. It clusters, it shows also on the, uh, the triple helix cooperation which we started especially in, on the electri electro vehicles. Um, the current projects, uh, uh, probably it's very important and very interesting to say, but uh, the time is running up, so I, I have to finish. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is the head of Department for Natural Resources and Environmental Protection in Moscow, Mr. Anton Kulib Kulbachevsky. Please come on up. Thank you. Уважаемые дамы и господа, я рад приветствовать вас от имени всех жителей Москвы. Хочу чуть-чуть рассказать о том, что происходит в нашем городе. Буду говорить по-русски, потому что так будет быстрее, ограничено время, и я думаю, вам будет намного понятней. В 2013 году, 2013 год был объявлен в России годом охраны окружающей среды. Мы пересмотрели работу многих московских трудоохранных органов и решили, что требуется незамедлительная выработка качественно новой стратегии экологического развития. В связи с новыми экологическими вызовами и задачами, стоящими перед столицей, мы начали разработку новой экологической стратегии города до 2025 года. 
Стратегии получили развитие приоритеты, обозначенные правительством Москвы и мэром Сергеем Собяниным. Выступая на градостроительном форуме, Сергей Семенович обозначил, что Москва – это постиндустриальный город. Я считаю, что в будущем Москва, безусловно, сохранит функцию культурно-образовательного центра. Но вот представление о городе как о промышленном центре <coughs> или транспортно-пересадочном узле стоит оставить в прошлом. Нет сомнений, что для постиндустриального города, лишенного собственных промышленных производств, на первую линию значимости выходит его социальная составляющая – общественная наполненность и пригодность города для жизни. Это значит, что роль населения уже не ограничивается рамками рабочей силы в экономике. Социальный фактор начинает активно влиять на выборы пути развития города. В полуполитических баталиях во время предвыборной кампании мэра в сентябре прошлого года возникали различные программы по решению экологических проблем города. По ним выдавались обещания и комментарии. Однако, как показало время, весь этот процесс в силу излишней политизированности оказался далек от прагматики. И более того, некоторые реальные проекты, например, озеленение Тверской и Центральной улицы города, едва не оказались замороженными, попав в перекрестие политических пикировок. В мае прошлого года департаментом продопользования начал эксперимент по озеленению Тверской улицы. Поскольку центральная часть города испытывает дефицит в зеленых насаждений, из-за развитой инженерной инфраструктуры нет возможности высаживать деревья в открытый грунт, то было принято решение высадить деревья в озоны. Так как исторически на Тверской были высажены липы, то было принято решение поддержать традиции на весенне-летний период высадить липы, а на осенне-зимний период отправить летние породы деревьев на реабилитацию в питомник и заменить их хвойными породами деревьев. По моему мнению, пример лишний раз доказывает, что политические формы решения экологических проблем не всегда удачны. Наша позиция – это широкий диалог, направленный на результат повышения степени комфортности и проживания в городе. Нам не интересна позиция, когда люди только критикуют, но взамен ничего не предлагают. Но в то же время мы очень ждем отдельных предложений, как от экспертного сообщества, так равно от каждого москвича, без исключения. Во многих крупных европейских городах уже давно осознали истинную ценность дикой природы и стараются, не жалея средств, вернуть ее на городские территории. И это в большинстве случаев не только благотворительность, но и прагматика. В озелененных и экологически благоустроенных городских кварталах стоимость квадратного метра недвижимости, как правило, в разы выше, чем в соседних неблагоустроенных районах. Давайте обсудим вопрос организации пространства в городе. Мой друг и партнер по осмыслению экологического ландшафта Москвы, философ-урбанист Ян Гейл, считает, что для того, чтобы соединить город в единое целое, его нужно сначала разделить на кластеры, зоны, округа, а уж потом, как из пазлов, собирать единое целое. Я вполне разделяю его мнение о том, что без исключения все городостроители, а именно архитекторы, урбанисты, работники транспортной сферы должны смотреть на город с позиции пешехода. И что настоящий город для людей должен быть живым, безопасным, привлекательным, устойчиво развивающимся и здоровым. Мне очень нравится пример Копенгагенской улицы Нюрбро с превалирующей арабской, турецкой, пакистанской, боснийской, сомалийской и албанской общинами, вечно загруженной автомобилями, имевшую весьма скандальную репутацию из-за постоянных беспорядков, а также столкновения радикальной молодежи и полиции. Ян Гейл смог увидеть и реализовать ее совершенно иной потенциал. Он предложил преобразовать улицу в пешеходно-велосипедную, разбавленную зелеными зонами скверов и рекреаций. Сегодня это достопримечательность города Копенгагена. Конечно, экология не самый прямой способ разрядки социальной напряженности, но как одна из мер, почему бы и нет. Кстати, городской пейзаж, воспринимаемый исключительно из окна автомобиля или автобуса, и даже из окна дома, например, высотки, противоречит самой природе человеческого восприятия. С удовольствием поделюсь некоторыми результатами наших исследований. Мы организовали акцию «Фото из окна». В рамках акции к нам прислали тысячи фотографий города, сделанные из окон машин, квартир и даже самолетов. Но вот парадокс. Даже все вместе фотографии не создавали ощущения единого целого. Это ощущение появляется только тогда, когда человек воспринимает город не со стороны, а изнутри. Москва занимает одно из первых мест среди мировых столиц по площади, занятой зелеными насаждениями. Фактическая площадь территорий, занятых зелеными насаждениями, в Москве составляет 54,5%. Доля озелененных территорий в границах красных линий – 49%. В последние годы в Москве ведется активное строительство, развивается улично-дорожная сеть, вводятся новые современные транспортные развязки, реконструируются старые промышленные зоны, строится комфортабельное жилье. В условиях роста объема строительства обеспечивается сохранение балансовых показателей озелененных территорий. Ежегодно в рамках программных мероприятий по компенсационному озеленению организации досуга населения на особо охраняемых природных территориях в прошлом году посажено более 48 тысяч деревьев и 126 тысяч кустарников. Для повышения комфорта проживания в городе Миллионники в августе прошлого года мэром Москвы было принято решение об упрощении процедуры посадки деревьев на придомовых территориях. 
Ранее от жителей поступало много просьб высадить деревья именно во дворах, но процедура была сложной, требовалось утвердить проект под каждое дерево, прежде чем его высадить. Теперь жителям было предложено просто выбрать понравившиеся породы деревьев и кустарников из социального буклета, подготовленного департаментом природопользования. Акция получила условное название по аналогии с Лондоном «Миллион деревьев». В настоящее время формируется адресный перечень дворов, где будут высаживаться деревья в рамках данной акции уже весной 2014 года. А всего в течение 10 лет мы планируем высадить миллион деревьев и кустарников в московских дворах. На компенсационную посадку деревьев город ежегодно тратит порядка 2 миллиардов рублей. Это деньги выделяются из бюджета города. В последнее время в Москве активно строится новое комфортабельное жилье. Для повышения эстетической привлекательности жилых домов мы прорабатываем вопрос озеленения крыш с использованием нового поколения материалов и методов гидроизоляции, исключающих протечки. В Москве около 17 тысяч гектар особо охраняемых природных территорий, на которых ограничена любая хозяйственная деятельность. На этих территориях для жителей мы создаем специальные места для организованного отдыха, организуем велосипедные дорожки, площадки для занятия спортом, катки, лыжные трассы, площадки для игры в футбол, места для купания. Наружное освещение общественных зеленых пространств проводится с применением светодиодных светильников. В прошлом году на северо-востоке Москвы на одной из особо охраняемых природных территорий департаментом была запущена электростанция на солнечных батареях. Практически на всех природных территориях оборудованы модули на солнечных батареях, обеспечивающие свободный доступ к Wi-Fi. Использование альтернативных источников энергии важно как для регулирования энергозатрат, так и для снижения негативной нагрузки на естественную природную среду. Динамично развивающегося города очень важно удержать баланс между интересами бизнеса, общества и населения с обеспечением экологической безопасности и устойчивости инфраструктуры. Создать комфортные условия для проживания и функционирования различных отраслей экономики города невозможно без обеспечения его чистой питьевой водой. В Москве для подготовки питьевой воды, а также для обезвреживания сточных вод, образующихся на территории города и прилегающих городов Московской области, создано специализированное производственное объединение «Мосводоканал». Объем водоподготовки составляет около 3,5 миллиона кубометров, объем водоотведения – 4 миллиона кубометров в сутки. Для обеспечения необходимой санитарно-экологической безопасности в Мосводоканале существуют большие многоступенчатые очистные сооружения. От жителей близлежащих домов поступали жалобы о неприятном запахе, идущем от очистных сооружений. В рамках природоохранных мероприятий запланировано реализовать современный проект по перекрытию открытых очистных сооружений специальным куполом с использованием нового поколения материалов и методов гидроизоляции. Мосводоканал на реализацию данного проекта запланировал около 5 миллиардов рублей, что соответствует эквиваленту около миллиона евро, миллиарда евро. Это серьезный шаг, но не единственный. Для уменьшения антропогенной нагрузки на окружающую среду и повышения экологической безопасности мы закрыли цементный элеватор, реконструировали очистные сооружения Московского нефтеперерабатывающего завода. Также правительство Москвы провозглашены приоритеты «Здоровый город», «Комфортный город», также приоритетами названо активное внедрение зеленых технологий, создание условий для здорового образа жизни, формирование экологического мировоззрения. Ключевой тезис – вернуть город человеку. В целом города все, все больше сейчас конкурируют по качеству жизни и по притягательности. В самые привлекательные города приходят посетители, туристы. Если город пригоден для жизни, привлекателен, его выбирает вне зависимости от границы принадлежности. Анализ мирового опыта позволяет выделить 6 модулей устойчивости в мегаполисе. Это городской транспорт, бытовые отходы, водопотребление, энергосбережение, озеленение, жилище. Иными словами, реализация устойчивости на дому в каждом городском доме и в каждой квартире. Мы проводим и планируем работу по повышению экологической устойчивости городской инфраструктуры на бюджетной основе в рамках частного государственного партнерства и чисто инвестиционных вложений. На проведение различных правоохранных мероприятий в Москве ежегодно выделяется около 20 миллиардов рублей бюджетных средств и порядка 40 миллионов внебюджетного финансирования. У нас много задумок, большой природный и человеческий потенциал. Мы полностью открыты для плодотворного сотрудничества и готовы реализовывать инновационные проекты, обеспечивающие экологически безопасное устойчивое развитие многомиллионного города. Thank you very much. Благодарю за внимание. Great. So some really, really good examples uh, that we can talk about. And I want to thank my colleagues again for keeping on time. And, and also want to thank Mr. Kubachevsky for uh, choosing Johannesburg over Sochi and uh, wishes, wish, uh, wish Russia well with the Olympics. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, from Washington, D.C., Keith Anderson. He's the director of the District Department of the Environment.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, and before I get started, I just wanted to take this opportunity uh, to, uh, let me just say it's an honor to be here. And I wanted to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank the city of Johannesburg and the C40 staff to put together such a wonderful event. This is important work that we're doing here, ladies and gentlemen, and you should be proud of everything that you do for your cities and your country on environmental protection. Um, so, Mayor Gray, the mayor of Washington, D.C., uh, ha is implementing an ambitious, sustainable D.C. plan. And some of the goals of that plan are to make 100% of the river, river swimmable and fishable by 2032 in the District of Columbia, to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 50%, and to cut energy use by 50%, increase the renewable power by 50%, and increase transit, bike, and walking trips, uh, make all those trips 75% of all trips. And to do this, the District of Columbia is investing billions of dollars in this infrastructure. For instance, for clean water, DC's Clean, Ro uh, clean Rivers Project to control storm, uh, con storm water runoff comes with a price tag of $2.5 billion. Mass transportation, in addition to our subway system and bus system, we're, at, we're introducing the streetcar back to the Washington, D.C. We had it 50 years ago, it went away, and now we're bringing it back. And that comes uh, with a very hefty price tag. We're also greening all of our public buildings um, to reach at least, at the very least, gold standards, lead gold standards. So how are we doing this? We're doing this with a, a mix of funding sources. The traditional sources of financing are probably familiar to, familiar to you. Those include customer rates and fees, municipal and utility bonds, federal grants, property assessments, and tax increment revenue. However, we are also pursuing a number of innovative finance options. Some are already moving in the District of Columbia, and some we are still in the exploration phase. For instance, credit marketplaces. Based on city law and regulation, establishing a base value for renewable power and now stormwater management. Savings back contracts. You, we use energy savings guarantee to pay back upfront investments. We're using power purchase agreements, which enables us to use the city's long-term buying power to leverage equity investments for the private sector. Special tax assessments. DC was one of the first cities in the country to launch a PACE financing program to fund energy efficiency improvements in commercial, institutional, and multifamily unit projects. Now some of the um, innovative financing mechanisms that are still in the exploration are on-bill utility financing. Finance, this is a financing mechanism which allows property owners to repay energy or other resource improvements through their utility bills. And green banks. A green bank, or otherwise known as a state clean energy finance bank, is a public or quasi-public organization created to provide direct and indirect financing to clean energy projects. So I want to discuss a couple of projects that we have in the pipeline as we speak and how we're financing them. In the District of Columbia, we have over 80,000 street lights. We are now in the process of replacing them with LED street lights. And we're using a savings back contract uh, with an energy savings guarantee based on a $4 million a year energy savings. Um, we're expanding our renewable energy capacity. DC's renewable energy credit market is the strongest in the nation and an important factor in solar and ge geothermal expansion. Long-term power purchase agreements are allowing DC to install solar PV on schools and to explore installation of new commercial scale wind power in the region dedicated to the city of Washington, DC. We're strengthening our electric grid resilience. DC will use more traditional funding sources to protect infrastructure and leverage opportunity for microgrids and distributed generation. And of course, the streetcar ex expansion. Which, will, which relies on traditional transport models of bonds and grants, but 
also on leveraging the increase in property value along corridors and we have a proposal, which is not finalized, to use part, a, a partnership model with the private sector. As in most cities that, that I've heard uh, over the last couple of days, stormwater is a priority. For Washington, stormwater is a lang long-standing priority, particularly around the Anacostia River that has been for so long a divider of the east and west sections of Washington, D.C. It has historically divided the haves and have-nots. And in one of the efforts that we're using to control the stormwater runoff in the Anacostia, it comes with a $2.5 billion price tag. Unfortunately, over 3 billion gallons of raw, untreated stormwater flow into the Anacostia every year. And we're, we're looking to solve that problem with about a $2.5 million price tag. So while we're tapping traditional sources of taxpayer funds and stormwater fees, we are also working to create a new market that values stormwater protection. Our stormwater, stormwater regulations are setting a value of stormwater control, but giving the market flexibility to determine how to most efficiently allocate stormwater costs. The new marketplace is also designed to leverage greater stormwater control by spreading investment out across a larger geographical footprint. Those looking for credit to meet the new stormwater regulations will pay others who install certified stormwater control that exceed regulatory requirements. We fully expect this flexibility to re reduce capital costs by 40% while increasing annualized stormwater co control by 57%. Excuse me, I'm missing a slide here. Bear with me. Let me just go back. While we're tapping traditional sources to pay, for, uh, pay taxpayer funds for stormwater fees, we are also working to create a new market that values stormwater protections. Our stormwater regulations are setting a value for stormwater control, but giving the market, hold on. I've already used this slide, I believe. I think you have an older version. But nevertheless, uh, we expect, with the new stormwater regulations, we fully uh, expect the flexibility to reduce capital costs by 40% while increasing annualized stormwater control by 57%. Um, we get greater volume control as green infrastructure is spread out because these systems are always in place capturing rain for all rain events, small and large. 90% of the rain in the district comes from smaller storms. So expanding the size of green infrastructure greatly increases our ability to manage stormwater. And with the expansion of green infrastructure, we are also seeing growth in green business and jobs for green roofs, low imp impact development, and urban forestry in other related areas. So, uh, we are very excited to share our experience with the stormwater credit training and other mechanisms to learn and to learn from other C40 cities. And we have much to learn as we move forward in the future. Thank you for your time. Okay, those are great presentations, some really good examples, and I think uh, fertile ground for us to have uh, some good discussion. What I'd like to do now is invite all of our speakers up to the podium for some questions and answers. I'm gonna start with a really quick one uh, while our panelists come up to the stage. Um, and my question is, uh, thank you. <clears throat> so the question is, um, in all these efforts and the work that you do, uh, is there a gap between the environmental and sustainability teams within your city government and the finance teams in terms of language uh, or knowledge, and how do you bridge that gap? That's a very good question. Let's see, a microphone. So we're passing the... Wait, I'm going to pass this. Uh, I think... It I think uh, you should be on. Uh, historically, there has been a gap, um, but as we understand the effects of climate change and how it affects our cities, I think what we're seeing is 
that our teams are now working together to address it. Um, because this is something that cities have to deal with. We have to adapt to climate change. We have to put the correct uh, mechanisms in place uh, to ensure that our cities are safe and that our uh, constituents um, are able to thrive and live in a sustainable society. So what we're seeing now is that our financial people, our sustainable uh, folks, and our environmental protection uh, uh, staff are working together, we're closely together more than ever, um, because I think we all understand uh, the bigger picture at hand. That's great. Anyone else want to answer? I think it's a challenge every year, but we have some funds uh, who are fed by these taxes. So they, these funds are allocated for investments for park and ride or for uh, subsidize some investments for re uh, refurbish uh, housing, etc. But to get investments and funds from the yearly budget, it's a fight every year. So actually in our case, uh, uh, the main problem is uh, uh, not with the people and understanding of the problem of the city, uh, but it's the problem uh, with our, let's say, limits that we have in the public finances, the 60% of the debt, and that's why we are looking for uh, some models how to finance the project by the project financing on the, uh, on the, on the, on the companies. Uh, we have a lot uh, that uh, either European Union, either European Investment Bank, EBRD, they like environmental projects. So uh, we don't, we never had a problem with uh, the communication how the important about the importance of the project and why why they are uh, why they are why, why we need it. Sometimes we have a problem, and that's the that's the case. We have the problem more uh, with convincing uh, uh, people uh, uh, who are responsible for the financing that the uh, environment or the climate change issues are not, uh, they, are, they are not concentrating on focus only on rainwater, uh, wastewater, water, energy efficiency, etc. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, solutions that we can use, uh, such as smart metering, for example, uh, or uh, uh, biking systems, uh, which are also very, very needed and also very needed for the climate change. And officially, they, they couldn't be financed uh, uh, from this, uh, let's say, sources that are available from the governmental level or international one. У нас последние три года уже в Москве серьезно развивается, серьезно развиваются уже инвестиции непосредственно в зеленые проекты. До этого, конечно, уровень инвестиций практически отсутствовал, потому что, во-первых, не было гарантий, не было заинтересованности правительства города в реализации зеленых проектов. Поэтому сейчас мы только, я считаю, в самом начале пути. Как раз нам очень ценен международный опыт, опыт других городов, которые мы активно изучаем. Но количество инвестиций непосредственно в зеленые проекты за последние три года увеличилось в 20 раз. То есть сейчас уже около 5 миллиардов евро в эквиваленте деньги, которые поступают непосредственно на реализацию тех или иных зеленых проектов. Мы, конечно, понимаем, что потенциал Москвы он еще более и выше, то есть надо деньги вкладывать, но проблема существует, потому что, допустим, в транспортную инфраструктуру нам удалось привлечь инвестиции, а вот в инфраструктуру, скажем так, социально ответственную, это энергетика, это энергосбережение, это жилищно-коммунальное хозяйство. Там, конечно, пока еще инвесторы идут неохотно, и мы сейчас определяем правила игры. Эти правила игры, игры еще не определены. Мы не можем полностью, скажем так, те же объекты, допустим, которые за водоподготовку отвечают или за тепло, потому что это серьезная социальная ответственность, отдать в руки частного бизнеса. Поэтому, конечно, частное государственное партнерство – это, наверное, основная форма, как мы с инвесторами пытаемся взаимодействовать. Но в связи с тем, что, конечно, проекты, они медленно окупаются в течение большого количества лет, у нас пока еще… Русские инвесторы предпочитают более быстрые проекты вкладываться. Это строительство жилья, это вложение денег в московскую недвижимость. Это на самом деле на данном этапе выгодно. А вот инфраструктуру, к сожалению, они вешают на плечи бюджета и города. Вот это, наверное, основная проблема, которую мы пытаемся решить. Great, thank you. Why don't we uh, turn to the audience? It looks like there are a few hands up. And if you could just um, state your name and also you, uh, who you're affiliated yeah. with, that would be yeah, great. This is, Thank you. This is Luis Gutierrez. I am the General Secretary of the Latin American Association of uh, CBRT, Integrated System and BRTs. It is a question that is coming from the, de the developing countries. 
you know. You have a, a show, some samples about uh, project finance schemes, like our colleague of uh, Barsoft uh, introduced. Mainly, the business in these cases is project finance. So, I will raise a similar, a similar question about uh, what do, uh, in what way do you deal with the uh, private banks? What is your connection, what your, is your language to attract the private bank? Because social responsibility is not the only one call. We have to uh, be able to create the uh, package you know, the formula, the scheme to attract the private, the private, because private finance is a cash flow management. And cash flow management is risk management, management. And risk management is a very hard business, you know. So what is your position about how to deal with the private bank? Because in the case of the developing country, it's very hard to have, you know, the private bank together for the hard business because the private, the private banks go to the uh, massive tran transportation, for example, metros. You have the private bank there. But when you need to deal with integrating system more complicated, soft, with a need of organizational restructuring, you know, of the, of, the, of the whole transportation system, you have not the bank with you, because it's very hard to have the, the private bank with you. That is a question for you. What is the way that you deal with the private bank to have they, them with you working in the hard part of the business? Thank Welcome you. Welcome Citibank here. Thank you. Anybody want to? Uh, actually, I can, uh, I can begin with, uh, with one remark about the uh, private uh, uh, banks. Um, uh, as, I, as, I, as I said in my presentation, as I, uh, as I marked, uh, um, uh, we are not using uh, actually private banks to, to finance infrastructure, but the private banks are very important uh, uh, just to uh, uh, deliver some services which are, so, which are really important in case of issuing bonds, for example, on the international markets. And uh, then we are using private banks. But uh, to be honest, um, uh, you, uh, uh, you raised a really uh, important problem about the safety of the transaction. Uh, the main uh, challenge that we had in 2007 uh, was that uh, uh, all of our companies uh, were not, uh, not good, very good trustable uh, partner for the transaction because uh, they uh, based on uh, yearly contracts, for example. Let's concentrate on transportation. Uh, we decided to uh, sign with them the contracts for 30 years and they get uh, in one year a very huge leverage uh, to get finance from the market. Doesn't matter uh, if uh, we talk about the private uh, uh, banks or uh, international institutions such as EIB or EBRD. It so doesn't matter because uh, the, the only difference that we have between these two, these two instruments is the cost of the financing. So it's the, it's the profits that get banks for, uh, for, for the loans. Uh, but uh, what, we, uh, what we did uh, just to uh, take the money uh, from the market, it was uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, assure uh, for the, our companies that they're going to have the money from the city for 30 years, for 20 years, for the service that they, that they, they made for the city, such as buses, trams, uh, uh, trains also, and the subway. В Москве. Прежде всего, наверное, это все-таки строительство платных автомагистралей, которые из области приводят в город. Сейчас вот мы реализуем два проекта как раз за счет частных инвестиций. Это два дублера Кутузовского проспекта, северный и южный. Это в дальнейшем будут такие серьезные востребованные трассы, очень большой трафик по ним будет. И, в принципе, инвестору это будет выгодно. Здесь форма сотрудничества инвестору непосредственно передается то имущество, которое он профинансировал. И определенное количество лет он его эксплуатирует и получает, скажем так, <coughs> возвращает свои инвестиции и получает свою прибыль. После чего он передает все это дело на баланс города. 
Ну, проект окупаемся рассчитан где-то на 30 лет. Если взять систему метрополитена, мы тоже привлекаем частные инвестиции. Сейчас у нас активно в Москве идет строительство метрополитена. У нас такие амбициозные планы построить за 10 лет столько, сколько было построено за все советские годы. То есть это где-то более 100 километров метрополитена мы должны вести строй. Поэтому, конечно, не хватает не только бюджетных денег, в том числе, конечно, частные инвестиции очень важны. Но здесь мы не можем, мы четко понимаем, что, допустим, взять инвестору отдать одну линию или там один переход или перегон между двумя станциями, которые он профинансировал, практически невозможно, поэтому здесь уже выступают гарантии той фирмы, на, которой, на балансе которой находится вся инфраструктура метрополитена, которая ее эксплуатирует, получает прибыль, собирает сборы, поэтому есть гарантии определенные, инвестор, опять же, получает по контракту там, ежемесячно, по графику те деньги, из прибыли предприятия. Да? Это, вот, наверное, основное, что может быть единственная форма, потому что создавать частные линии метрополитена ну, нецелесообразно по различным причинам. Не буду их перечислять. Да, спасибо. Well, I think one of the things that you were getting at is mitigating risk. Um, and let's just be honest with each other. Whether you're a developing country or an established country, what the banks or investors want to see is return on investment. Bottom line, am I right? Um, and so, what the challenge is in in in, in Washington D.C. when we're using um, private capital to, like I mentioned in my presentation, install streetlights um, to the tune of a four million dollar savings a year, which we then go in to uh, reinvest or pay off that 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 loan essentially. So the the deal is you have to be able to demonstrate that what you're investing in there's savings and that you will receive the return on investment that the banks seek. That that's always the bottom line. <laughs> that's right. And I think that's also the business case of our global infrastructure conference in Basel to bring together the owner of infrastructure projects, the planners the engineers together with the private sector, finance banks, in international banks, and to make the projects reliable for the investors. So we have to measure the effects of the investments so you can have mitigate the risk for the investors. That's a topic of Global Infrastructure Basel. And I'd like to, uh, if I could, maybe just echo some of those comments. I think um, uh, there are opportunities for, for commercial banks to partner with, with multilateral banks like the World Bank. And uh, in the case of the United States and, and, and elsewhere, one of the statistics that came up uh, in the C40 report was the proliferation of, of municipal banks. And I think the key there is to figure out how to leverage those public funds effectively, how to use those public funds to leverage private capital. Uh, let's go to the next question. Back. Thank you very much. My name is Richard Calland. Uh, I'm based at the University of Cape Town, but I co-direct something called the African Climate Finance um, uh, hub and uh, we try and bring the supply and demand sides for international climate finance together um, particularly interested in infrastructure in cities and how cities can better position themselves in, on this continent in Africa to l access new sources of international climate finance now you're probably the wrong people to ask this question in a sense because you're in the developed world so to speak but from a developing world perspective um, is there any experience that you can bring to bear of cities collaborating together and putting together big high-level infrastructure projects which will attract high-level either private or public uh, support? Because in a sense that's what we see as part of the solution to the sorts of problems that were canvassed in the last plenary session, that cities in Africa at least may struggle to overcome those sorts of constraints on their own that they may have to partner and work across boundaries with other uh, cities, um, complex though that may be. Uh, I, I'll, I'll stop there. This argument's made out in an op-ed piece in, in today's business day, if you have access to it, which I, which I placed yesterday. Um, any thoughts on that from any experience of, of, of cities in the north collaborating uh, in order to put themselves in a stronger position to lever, use public finance to lever private capital or else to access 
uh, international climate finance. Thank you. So I might, if it's okay. Uh, I I'll, have not had that experience, so perhaps okay. you may know more about that. Well, I'll, I'll take a, a first shot and then uh, turn to the panel. So, so one of the issues, I think, one of the universal issues in this space is that one of the trends is to decentralize and fragmented interventions. So take energy efficiency. Instead of a single fixed point power plant, we're looking at trying to reach the same amount of kilowatts through improving the built environment. And the challenge is aggregating and getting to scale. And one initiative that we've been involved with in the United States is a program to aggregate uh, across jurisdictions where, we are, where, where there are very successful local programs, either state or city run, um, but those programs aren't large enough to attract uh, capital markets investors. And so we've been involved in a consortium effort to bring together a number of states programs where we will serve as the capital markets intermediary. We will purchase loans from those programs, warehouse them, and then package them for, for the capital markets. Um, so I, I think your, your point is well taken. I think um, one of the challenges in this space, and I think it was the mayor of Vancouver and maybe some, some of our colleagues here on the panel uh, uh, here mentioned aggregation. Aggregation, I think, is really key. And standardization, I think, is also quite important. And we'll see if, if anyone else wants to add to, to that. Actually, uh, uh, we have a very uh, strange model in, in our country because uh, we, we don't have uh, any cooperation between mega cities. So we don't cooperate with any other Polish cities, uh, big cities. Uh, but what we are trying to do is uh, uh, to uh, merge uh, the services uh, within uh, agglomeration area. Um, actually, in our metropole, uh, which is 3.3, we have uh, four uh, waste agglomeration, three uh, wastewater agglomeration, at least uh, two electricity agglomeration. It means that uh, uh, some infrastructure is pending on, uh, on some uh, element of, uh, which produce uh, or, uh, or treats some, some elements uh, of uh, this, you know, services. Uh, uh, use some services or, uh, or take. The, the main problem that we have is uh, that, based on Polish law, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can use this, uh, let's say, merging uh, instruments, but we always have uh, to have a leader. Uh, so we always are the leader, so we are maintaining the, uh, let's say, the coast. And it's, uh, it's always a very hot discussion about the covering uh, of the coast, uh, which are operational on such, uh, such contracts. But we are trying now uh, what is uh, one of the good examples, uh, we are merging the uh, services uh, and, we are, and we are merging our, let's say, uh, uh, capacity of uh, cities which are surrounding the Warsaw and we have one purchase group for, uh, uh, f for heat, for example, or for e electricity. That's the, that's, the, that's the job that we are uh, now uh, uh, working on. I might just add one, one quick additional comment. You, you did ask, I think, about how public funds might come, to play, come into play. And, and what I didn't mention in, in what we're doing and I, I think is implicit in what you're suggesting is it becomes more, as when, when you consider something cross-jurisdictional, it adds a layer of complexity. And um, so that has, to be that has to be addressed and mitigated somehow and, and public funds could potentially help to, to address that. Um, why don't we uh, take another question? Oh, sorry, and then we'll come to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tabo Matlachi from the city of Jobek. Um, I, I would like you to unravel the, the whole concept of a municipal bank. Hmm. How does it function? Does it function as a, a savings bank specific from the municipality itself? or it's a current account type of a bank where you, over time, um, do the savings or borrow certain individuals in order for you to get some uh, interest and therefore be able to finance your infrastructure. That's one aspect. The second aspect is the user pay principle on the storm water drainage system. Do you put meters, P 
per each and every household that flush the toilet that use its um, um, yes, every, water every, system? Yeah, so when I was talking about the stormwater, I was All talking right. more about uh, commercial property. All right. But to All answer right. your question specifically, every home in Washington, D.C. is individually metered uh, by, our, by our, our, our water uh, company. Uh, it's called D.C. Water by our Municipal Water Company. Um, so when, when we talk about stormwater um, credits, any land or any development project in Washington, D.C. that is 5,000 square feet or more has to adhere to the district stormwater regulations. And they thereby have to retain um, enough stormwater in a 1.2 rain event. Um, and so they have to be able to capture that stormwater on site. And if they cannot capture that Im amount of stormwater on site, then they, have, they at least have to capture half of it. 0.6, and if they cannot capture the entire 1.2, then they have to pay into an in lieu fee, um, and where we'll we'll um, uh, put up stormwater measures on another site. So that's what I was mentioning when I was talking about the stormwater credits. Now we have some developers in Washington D.C. that are going above and beyond the 1.2, uh, up to 1.7 uh, inch, uh, inches of stormwater on the site, and thereby they can trade that 0.5 inches and they could sell it to another developer who perhaps cannot reach that 1.2 uh, limit. So that's where the, the trading or that market um, comes into play. Um, did you want to talk about the municipal banks? I'd be happy to do that unless... Um, Anyone else have any? Okay, so a, 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 quick, uh, a quick one on that. Typically, uh, in, in the US, the municipal banks or the state banks, they're being capitalized with public funds for the purpose of trying to um, fill gaps that are currently not being met by commercial banks. And so they're being set up to try to leverage and encourage more private capital. That's short answer. I think, um, oh, I'm sorry. Did someone else have a, okay. I think the gentleman over here was, has been patiently waiting. Uh, thank you, I'm Timothy Fashion from the provincial government of uh, KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. Okay. Um, I, I suppose this uh, uh, this question is going to be um, it may it, it may vary from country to country. How do you go around sourcing external financial assistance without going through the federal government or even state or provincial government? Secondly. Uh, most of the presentation really paint very good and uh, livable future for all of us. After this, after this com uh, post commissioning exercise, after running the system, after the 2032 or whatever, it seems as if we are going to have free. I mean, uh, people will not need to pay more. Is there a system whereby people we have now to be rebated? or maybe people will now just be using most of these things freely after maintaining them. Thanks. I'm sorry, if you don't mind, can you repeat your first question again? The question is, how do you source as a city yes. external funding without going through the federal government? <laughs> Oh, well, let me be clear. We do go to the federal government, and we do receive, in Washington, D.C., we mm -hmm. do receive funding from the federal government, but we have to go beyond that. And this is why we have developed systems as our, our stormwater credit trading system in our sustainable D.C. plan, because if we relied on the funding from the federal government alone, we would never be able to achieve some of the, the measures in our sustainable D.C. plan. So we had to find innovative ways to finance some of the uh, projects to combat climate change. Um, it was just an absolute must. Uh, we were very thankful for the dollars we get from the federal government, but we, we realized that if we really want to reach our goals, that we had to be innovative and creative and take it a step further. And James, I don't know um, if there's anybody here from uh, the World Bank, but I know, um, do we have a colleague here? So I, I don't want to, I'll do my best to speak for them, and maybe James, you, you can as well. I do know that um, I think this relates directly to your question, which is the World Bank typically 
engages at the national level, but I think they are now trying to put in place a, a, um, a facility or an ability to engage directly with cities. Um, and I, if there are others that want to... Ну, я тоже расскажу, как в Москве проходит у нас взаимодействие э, муниципальных и федеральных органов исполнительной власти, которые находятся тоже в Москве, имеют свое имущество. И вот федеральное имущество, которое находится непосредственно на территории города, оно финансируется как раз за счет федерального бюджета. Также федералы э, судебно, судебную систему э, финансируют органы полиции, потому что у нас... Муниципальный уровень не может финансировать э, силовые структуры, э, судебную систему. То есть это все находится в ведении федералов. А все, все остальные проекты финансируются за счет бюджета, который довольно-таки велик в нашем городе. Поэтому у нас как таковых вот проблем с бюджетом, конечно, он дефицитный, но не настолько. И мы в любом случае привлекаем инвестиции частных банков, в основном под гарантией правительства Москвы, либо заключаем долгосрочные контракты от 15 до 20 лет, как вот сейчас, например, у нас... На вывоз мусора мы заключили по округам, разбили город там, на 10 округов и заключили на 20 лет контракты непосредственно с одними операторами. Как раз это частное финансирование. Таким образом город прогарантировал на 20 лет э, те деньги, э, которые заложены в тариф, которые посели, э, получаются населения. И в принципе под этот контракт уже э, любая фирма может кредитоваться в любом банке. Это считается гарантией финансов. Yeah, yeah, I have only two <laughs> sentences. Uh, uh, we have always uh, the problem uh, uh, when we are starting about, started to think about some project on the environmental infrastructure. Uh, we also, we have to obey this principle, uh, polluters pay. So we always have to uh, think that uh, the users have to pay for the infrastructure. But the problem is exactly with the prices of the, uh, of the services. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, a rule, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a set of the indicators uh, and the prices of the water, of the wastewater, of the waste management, uh, they, couldn't, uh, um, uh, they, they couldn't be higher than a limit which is uh, uh, set up by European Union. So somehow, uh, in our case, the system is uh, already shaped, designed, uh, we, already have to, we only have to, to fulfill. What we do uh, when these prices are bigger than the limits, then we can have the financing from the in external instruments and we can prove that if we don't get the money, we're going to have the financial gap uh, or we have to raise the prices or, uh, above the limit, which is not allowed. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, somehow this system, is the, the construction of the system um, uh, help us to get the money. So I see, um, I'm going to come to Daniel and just, I see we're out of time on Q&A. We have a couple minutes for concluding remarks. Is that right? Two minutes. So uh, I'm going to take 30 seconds for concluding remarks. Uh, I know, uh, Daniel, I think you had a question or a comment, and then I will wrap up. Yes. And a, a microphone, if we could. Sure. Or, thanks. My name, is, my name is Daniel Wiener. I'm the chairman of Global Infrastructure Basel. And we are here, we speak about sustainability. And often when we speak about sustainability, when we see these examples, we see that it, it looks like a burden on the budget. But uh, I would like to point out to you to one feature of sustainability, which is very interesting for investors. And that's the potential of sustainability to de-risk mm -hmm. investments. Because sustainable, sustainable projects have the ability to be much uh, deeper rooted, uh, much de more deeply rooted in society and create a lot of added value and to also potentially serve for lower borrowing rates because they have a better risk return profile than non-sustainable solutions. Uh, I, I think f to, to end this discussion it's important to see the positive sides and also the de-risking power of sustainability and we have to be proud of what we're doing and uh, Global Infrastructure Basel is currently uh, working on a green credit rating system mm -hmm. which will uh, uh, bring the uh, added value of sustainability to the investor but also to the project owner by lowering borrowing rates it has been mentioned before for specifically for sustainable projects and um, you will hear more about it since uh, the global infrastructure Basel is a partner of the C40 you will uh, we will turn around these informations just briefly that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, please join me uh, first in um, 
again, thanking the city of Johannesburg, thanking C40 for this platform for sharing, and uh, thanking our speakers for excellent uh, examples, and all of you for excellent dialogue. Thank you.